Hi, I'm Mark Simon. Kevin Mullen is here as well. Welcome to another live online edition of The Game. Mark, it's good to be with you. As Americans continue to take to the streets, the importance and impact of this November's presidential election seems to grow exponentially. To talk about all that and more, we are happy, as always, to be joined by our friend, political science professor Melissa Michelson of Menlo College, although she's going to add another title soon, Dean of the College of Arts and Science at Menlo, effective July 6th. Congratulations. We have no doubt it's your appearance on the game that has rocketed you to this uh, level of success. Um, <laughs> Let's, Clearly. Welcome. It's happy to have you here. Let's plunge right in. Uh, what a year 2020 is turning out to be. A pandemic, economic crash, protests and politics. You study history, you study political science. This, is, this has got to be a, a unique year. I mean, I, th there are echoes, I suppose, of 1968. But in terms of what's going on, uh, I, I can't think of anybody who's lived through anything quite like this. Yeah, it's, we're living through 1968 and 1918 all at the same time and, and maybe um, a couple other crises thrown in there as well. So it's, yes, uh, we are living through quite a moment. And it's also, I think, important to note how different this is from the protests of the 60s because we are seeing such a diversity of voices and uh, types of folks out there protesting it's it's really like nothing America has ever seen to have um, so many allies and so many folks who are not black out there in the streets protesting for an end to violence against black people. That's unusual to see that. It, it does seem to have short term staying power in the sense that people will come and demonstrate, uh, as as, uh, as Martin Luther King said, the, the right to protest for right. Um, There'll be violence, there'll be uh, looting, and then they come back the next day. There'll be police violence um, in Lafayette Park, and they come back the next day. And people just seem to keep coming and coming, and it's growing. Um, does it have long-term staying power? What do you think? I think it does because partly we need to remember, of course, that it didn't just start right, that this fight has actually been going on for a long time. And I, I actually think what we're seeing is more of a peak of the activism and also a sense by those who are participating that something's happening, things are changing, right? That this is a moment where these protests and these calls for change are seeing results. And, and so that encourages more people right, who maybe have come in and out, has, have cycled in and out of activism over time. Now they say, no, now it's happening. And everyone who's cycled out is back in and more people are back in. So it's, it's staying power in part because for many years, we've, for decades, we've been building up to this moment where maybe finally the U.S. public and elected officials are ready to hear the message about police brutality and violence against black people. Kevin. Dean, it's great to be with you. Uh, this time does feel different to me. Uh, this period after the George Floyd murder, uh, there's been a, a continued focus now on police use of force and standards uh, as they vary across the country. In California, we adopted legislation championed by Dr. Shirley Weber, my colleague from San Diego, to change the police use of force standard uh, from reasonable to necessary, which may not sound like a significant switch, but that actually was quite a, 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 a political uh, battle uh, in this state. Uh, so are we seeing progress? Are we seeing signs of hope? that this isn't just a moment, that this is sustainable and will actually result in, in genuine change across the country? Well, I think we are. I think we're seeing every day more evidence that something's really happening here, right? Um, policies are being changed. The, uh, the charges against the officers who killed George Floyd have been upped. Um, peep, the FBI is looking into the murder of Breonna Taylor Various police departments, including in Minnesota, are re-examining their policies. And all over the country, including here in California, people are, are taking another look at the way that they oversee their police department. So 
yeah, it's re it's really different, and things are really changing. One of the things that strikes me is it, if you look at lessons that should have been learned from something like what we went through in 1968 with riots and in a lot of different kinds of violence. Um, it looks like the lesson that law enforcement learned is that they needed to gear up better to, to meet a riot uh, or, or violence with force. When in fact, a lot of those resources, rather than turning police departments into a paramilitary organization, might have been better spent trying to get at the underlying issues. And, and that, I guess, is the next question. Yeah, I think there's going to be significant police reform. Police departments are a top-down organization. Whatever behavior you see by the cops on the street, somewhere above them, it is tolerated, or at least people look the other way. But what about sort of the, the larger issue of economic injustice, housing injustice, educational injustice? What does it take to get to those things? Or, or is it you know, is it enough that this moment in time is going to be focused mostly on how police interact with African Americans in particular? I think it's all related. So I have so many things I want to say in response to you right now. One is I think what we're seeing in these scenes of from these peaceful protests is that quite often it's the police who are instigating the violence. And if there is violence or um, looting by a few folks, that's not the main people who are there to protest against police violence. And it is mostly what we're seeing on these videos that are being shared on social media and on the news is that it's police seem to be attacking the peaceful protesters, which is very much echoes of the 1960s. I do think part of it is these feelings of economic inequality, that the social safety net is falling apart, uh, that people are unemployed, even as President Trump was touting the new job numbers this morning, it was pointed out that actually black unemployment has gone up, even if employment uh, for white folks is getting better. So there's this, um, this joblessness, the economic impact of the pandemic and, you know, centuries of, um, of being mistreated and being held down by the system in so many ways. So that is all part of, of what's bringing people out to protest and to call for change. And yes, of course, we need to revisit our original sins of slavery and Jim Crow, and we need to do things to revitalize communities and to allow for actual equal opportunity and equal possibilities for success um, in black communities, in brown communities, in, in poor communities. But the violence is the number one thing that's a problem. And I think what white America is waking up to right now is the fact that the violence that they're seeing perpetuated by police in these videos is something that black communities have been living with for a long time. So they're, they're finally realizing that, so maybe people knew that there was income inequality, wealth inequality, educational inequality, but now they're realizing that actually what black people live with is ongoing oppression by local law enforcement. Yeah, there's nothing more striking than the uh, eight minute and 46 uh, second video of, of uh, that police officers kneeling on the man's neck. And as an aside, it, it's fascinating to me, you know, the, the law of unintended consequences applies to technology too. Who knew how socially revolutionary the iPhone was going to be, because now we're seeing all these things that probably were going on all along, but we just never saw them. And the drama of some exactly. of these videos is pretty striking. Kevin, another exactly. question from you. So, Melissa, this is a political show. I want to ask you about um, the <laughs> president's comments. Uh, the president's comments. Uh, in my opinion, he's the divider in chief. It's a divide and conquer political strategy. Most of these fundamental changes that we've been talking about on police use of force uh, can happen at the local level and the state level. But the president has the biggest megaphone in the country and sets a tone and the media covers it. Um, I, I just want to ask you about what you think um, this president is attempting to do um, with a look toward uh, this campaign that we're going to find ourselves in 
or are really in the midst of. It seems pretty Nixonian to me. He's tweeting about law and order. Uh, he's talking, yeah. he tweets in caps about silent majority. What is yeah. he attempting to do other than what is pretty obvious to me, which is divide this country, polarize, yeah. in, uh, if anything, make this an even more polarized country. But talk to us about just what, what are the kind of underlying politics here? Yeah, it's as a political scientist who studies campaigns, it is odd to see him running what seems to be a version of the Nixon 1968 campaign. And, you know, for those of us who, who didn't live through it or, or study it in 1968, mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson was president and the streets were full of protesters, full of anti-war protesters, full of civil rights protesters, full of all sorts of communities fighting for equality. And as the out party and as the challenger to the incumbent party, Nixon ran on this campaign of bringing back law and order and the silent majority, which was, of <clears> course, <throat> the silent white majority that wanted to see these protesters um, quieted and, and the streets cleaned up. And it's really bizarre to see the current incumbent president running on that platform when he is the incumbent president. Right. So when Nixon was doing it, it was to say the current president, Johnson, has failed. And that's why our streets are full of violence. And Trump is saying that there's been a failure. But, you know, as with the pandemic, he takes no responsibility. So I think he is trying to appeal to people who are freaked out by this moment to white people who see this as a problem caused by communities of color who are creating violence, who are looters, who are criminals. This is part of his whole criminalization of black and brown bodies. But, it, at, but politically, I think it's a, a difficult campaign strategy given that he's saying that the people in power have failed to maintain law and order. And so, you know, his, his base is likely to agree with that unless we see more leading Republicans or former Nixon, sorry, Trump administration, Freudian slip, Trump, more, more former Trump administration officials coming out and condemning what he's doing. I think there's a, a large body of folks who support the president who identify as Republicans who will continue to see this as something that is happening to Trump and not something that he's responsible for. But for a lot of people, this message about law and order and the silent majority doesn't make sense because he is supposed to be the one implementing law and order and, and ensuring law and order. And instead we get these really surreal, like Gilead kind of scenes of armed guards blocking off access to the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. It, it isn't 1968, of course. And Part of what Nixon was trying to do, I think, it was all part of his Southern strategy, which was, um, in addition to, I, I can just I can remember him calling his protesters these punks on our streets. He, he, loved, he liked to use the tough language, too. And, and that was a message that was probably going to resonate in the South that historically has you know, had a higher percentage of people who voluntarily serve in the military. And there's a sense of sort of that right-wing American patriotism that resonates more in the South. But it was a very different South in those days. It was much more uh, controlled by the, the white minority or majority, whatever you want to call it in those days. The South is much more diverse now, and its politics are much more split up. So I really wonder if, if it's just what he has to do because he's got nowhere else to go. I mean, what is he going to do? You know, by now, any other president would have gone on television and issued some sort of national call for unity and calm and let's see if we can't work together to solve this. He just simply can't do that. It's, uh, I think he's constant, you know, his, his inner being doesn't allow him to do that. But even if he did, it wouldn't ring true with people. And it might even tick off the people he's trying to appeal with the sort of get tough law and order message. And it, his strategies worked last time. I think part of understanding Trump and what Trump does is remembering what happened in 2015 and 2016, where all of these folks who were professional campaigners or elected officials were looking at what Trump was doing and saying, well, there's no way this is going to work, right? That kind of political strategy, there's no way he's going to be the president. This is a joke, right? And 
he not only won the nomination, but won the presidency. Speaking this way about uh, immigrants, speaking uh, in very racist ways about Black people, about uh, Muslim people, about members of the disability community, and it worked and he won. And so, you know, every campaign manager wins the runs the last winning campaign. So if it worked in 2016, he's going to double down for 2020 and run the same campaign because, hey, it worked last time. And I, I do think um, his chances of reelection are low, but there is still a chance. I think we also have to remember that a lot of those Southern states are still very Republican states, and there are still a lot of people who support this president. So, you know, is this is the result going to change? It's going to depend on a very small number of people in a very small number of states. And a lot of those crucial voters are white voters. So the question really looking to November is, do those white voters who supported Trump in 2020 or maybe voted third party, do they vote for Trump again? Or do they decide, no, it's time for a change. I'm not comfortable with this, right? And it, it is white voters who probably are going to decide the election because they're the, the swing voters in the Rust Belt and in these, these states where it's going to be close, like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. And so yeah. if Trump thinks this is a message that resonates with white voters, of course he's going to stick with it. Kevin, you want to talk a little bit about what the Democrats have to do? Right. So um, wanted to get your take, Melissa, on the vice president's handling of um, this uh, event in American life. Their strategies could not be more different. Uh, the vice president in recent polls that I've seen is up eight or nine points on the president. Do you think this moment that we find ourselves has changed the calculus for the vice president on what kind of a running mate he picks? It's probably still premature. Uh, to be talking about that. And it, it almost, honestly, it seems a little callous to even be talking about political calculations when the country's going through a moment like this. But in terms of uh, his calculations on how to actually ch change this country and win in November, what does he have to do uh, in the short run? Because it's impossible to know where we are in uh, September and October, but what does he need to do in the interim here? Yeah, I have to say, I think Biden's doing a really good job at being that voice that people need to hear. He's showing empathy. He's actually going and listening to people. He has those personal experiences of loss where he can really relate to people and, and, and hear what they're saying to him and relate to them in a way that people really do need to hear. He has really strong standing in the Black community. He is somebody that they feel like he has been there for him he has been there for them and that he's somebody who, who honestly cares about black people and about these problems that they're facing. And he's doing an excellent job, in my opinion, of going out and listening, being empathetic and, um, you know, getting out there as much as you can during an ongoing pandemic. As to the vice presidential slot, I think this just doubles down on what I and many other commentators have been saying for some time, which is that the vice presidential choice needs to be black. It needs to be a black woman since he's decided it's going to be a woman, which, of course, as a feminist, I endorse. And there are multiple excellent candidates out there for him to choose, all with pros and cons. But I think it sends a very strong message to the black community that um, that he's, it would send a very strong message. <clears throat> it would increase enthusiasm for the campaign and it would um, be the right thing to do. Black women have been such a core constituency of the Democratic Party that it's time that that, that loyalty and that presence, that they have been there, they have voted, they have organized. It's time for them um, to see that reflected in who's on the ticket. So I think Biden has been doing the right thing. And I think it's great that we're hearing rumors that at least three black women are being seriously considered to be his running mate. Uh, I've been to uh, the two local rallies, the one in Redwood City and the one in San Mateo that happened, I guess, just this week. It's, it's, 
yeah. time telescopes. Wednesday? You know, especially, when you're, Wednesday? especially when you're sheltering in place most of the time. But um, I was struck by how many people made some direct reference to November. And, and that mm -hmm. this, if this is a movement that perhaps has been building slowly, uh, I know Martin Luther King III and, um, and Al Sharpton are talking about a national march on Washington on the anniversary of the I Have a Dream March in August, which is a hell of a time to go to Washington. But um, does this manifest itself in November? Does this mean um, more voter registration? Does this mean higher turnout? Does this essentially unify uh, the black vote for Biden? Because there have been times when it looks like it could slip based on what slips he may make. Um, how does this manifest itself in November? Does this really uh, mean more people showing up and more people showing up with a unified purpose of, I don't care who the other guy is, I got to get this guy Trump out of here? Yeah, <laughs> I think many <laughs> leading people are saying exactly that. Like, we have got to get this guy out of here. And President Obama spoke on Wednesday and said, this is a both and. we we need to be out on the streets and we need to be demonstrating and we need to be speaking up against violence against black people and we need to vote in November, right? It's, it's not either or, both of these routes are important. And I think there's also a growing realization among voters that it isn't just about the president, that it's also about who's in power at the state and local level, right? I think the pandemic has made it really obvious to people that the situation you're going to live through in your state or in your county depends very much on who is the governor, who are your local officials. There's a growing realization that who is elected to be district attorney, who is elected to be sheriff is going to affect what's happening in your community. And so more and more people are doing this both and where they are protesting and demanding change now and planning to vote in November to make sure that the people that are in office are people who understand what these communities have been going through and are ready to enact policies that are going to make real change. But I think the question I'm trying to ask um, as, as poorly as I'm asking it is, your, your political assessment, is that going to happen? Do you think that yeah. there's something that's been, a fire has been lit under these people? They're not just talking about it. Well, to be show clear, we've room. had... We've had huge amounts of turnout ever since Trump won. We've had huge amounts, huge increases in turnout in every election since Trump won office, in every special election in 2017, in the midterm elections in 2018. People are fired up. They don't necessarily go vote when it's uh, something where there's not going to be a real change, right? Where it's a primary or it's... Um, uh, a little election that doesn't really matter, but when it's time to replace people, when it's time to replace Republicans with Democrats, or it's time to really get out there and, and make a difference, people are voting in huge numbers. So I think that enthusiasm is going to continue on into November. So I think, I don't think you're asking it the wrong way. I think what I'm trying to say is People do understand more than ever that elections matter, but that's something that's been true since November 2016, that people have realized over time that, hey, maybe I didn't vote, right? 100 million people who could have voted in November 2016 didn't vote. So voting really does matter. Imagine the world we'd have now if Hillary Clinton had won. I really got to vote. And that's just being reinforced every time there's another crisis, every time there's another horrible um, thing that happens, um, whether it's our botched response to the coronavirus, um, whether it's President Trump um, creating these trade wars. What, like, there's so many things I can't, like, my brain's just exploding with there's so many examples and people can look at what's happening and say, Trump's president and look what happened now, right? Trump's president. And this wouldn't have happened if Hillary had won. And I get it. I get it now. And I get a vote. Right. And even from 2018, right. Maybe they voted, maybe they didn't huge, huge, there were huge increases in turnout in 2018. And what happened? We got, we got a flip of the house where it's controlled by Democrats and that generated actual change, right? Things actually happened. Right now in Congress, 
um, they are trying to pass an anti-lynching bill. And our very own Kamala Harris has been pushing really hard for this bill. And that is something that people can see like, hey, there's all this violence in the streets and there's these centuries of oppression that we're trying to take care of. And Republicans won't even let us pass an anti-lynching bill, right? Um, if we take control of the Senate, things change, right? If we take control of the White House, things will change. So I think a lot of folks maybe go through their lives thinking who the president is doesn't matter, voting doesn't matter. And they've had an education over the past four years about how much elections really do matter, about how much voting actually is something that's worth their time, even if it's inconvenient, even if it means they got to spend some time figuring out, how, you know, how to jump through the hoops and figuring out who they're going to vote for on some of these lower ballot offices. They get it now that it's something they need to do. Yeah. Kevin. So, Melissa, I wanted to ask you about the president's attacks on voting by mail. Uh, San Mateo County and the state of California have led this effort, um, along with other states. I have to give Oregon and, and Colorado and Washington uh, a shout out as well. Uh, but we have uh, lived this on the local level where every voter automatically gets a ballot postage paid, drives turnout up, better participation from across the electorate. Uh, Trump has uh, taken aim at uh, what he's calling fraud and vote by mail, which we all know is a very minuscule uh, amount of fraud. Uh, there are issues with the databases in elections offices. And so this is not a perfect situation and it takes a long time to count those vote by mail ballots, that, that lag time. But talk about his attacks on vote by mail because many states may be relying more and more on voting by mail in crucial purple states that will decide uh, this election uh, what does that have the potential to do just in terms of uh, there may be energy in the electorate, but in terms of actually ballots being cast by voters uh, by means of mail? Uh, talk about that dynamic. So I think people are right now trying to figure out whether voting by mail is going to be uh, a viable solution. Right, because there are problems with vote by mail in terms of people being concerned that their ballot doesn't arrive on time. And I think what we saw in Wisconsin with the special election is an example of what I'm trying to say, right? That uh, people didn't necessarily get their vote by mail ballot in time, and then they ended up having to decide whether to go wait in line, right? Um, so people do have concerns about ballots getting lost in the mail. And I think that's why it's important that, for example, what we're doing here in California is that we continue to have places where you can go vote in person. But you can get people excited to vote by mail. You can um, harness that enthusiasm for voting and have it be online. What I'm seeing is that people are doing things online uh, like Zoom parties or, or live um, videos where people are talking about voting by mail and, and making sure that people understand what to do with their ballots. So um, I, am, I am not, I guess what I'm trying to say is I am not concerned that the switch to vote by mail will decrease turnout. I think as, as you mentioned, if anything, vote by mail increases turnout. It makes it easier for people to find the time to fill out their ballot. And if they are concerned about the mail, you know, we have drop boxes or um, other ways in which people can ensure that their ballot shows up. What I am entertained by in the vote by mail debate is, is that it was the tweets about the alleged uh, fraud attached to vote by mail that caused Twitter to flag Trump's tweets as being misleading and to point people towards accurate information by vote by mail about vote by mail. I think what that's even though there was then this big conversation about whether the president can be fact checked and the president threatening to um, sue Twitter or to do something to shut down social media if they did that. What it actually did is it drew attention to the tweet and to the fact that it wasn't true and that got it in the heads of more Americans that hey vote by mail actually the facts are that this is safe, that this is a good way to vote, that it, it is not 
necessarily voter fraud. It is actually just a safe way for people to vote during a pandemic and a nice way to be able to fill out your ballot without leaving your house. So I think actually uh, vote by mail is, is having a moment, not just because of the pandemic, but because of that tweet. And I really think it's outstanding that San Mateo County was able to help move California in that direction. And I, I am excited to see what happens in the fall when multiple states now turn to vote by mail, either as you know a bigger option than before or um, a new option. I think we're going to have huge increases in turnout in those states. Well, we'll see. I guess we'll all find out soon enough. Um, I think that's all <laughs> that's we have time That's the great thing about being today. a pundit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Time will tell. Am that's wrong? the classic Oops. pundit line. Time will tell. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, said Hillary I would win. Would, I got that one wrong. I, yeah, I, well, she, she did get the popular vote. I, I would actually there expect uh, that, that vote by mail was going to have less fraud because there's, I mean, I suppose someone could fill out someone else's ballot without their permission, but the opportunity for mischief is when all the votes are collected in one place in, in some machine. And I'm thinking of one election in San Francisco when they found a bunch of ballot boxes floating in the bay. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen vote by mail. But that's all we have yeah. time and for right all, now. So, okay, sorry. Well, go ahead, go ahead. No, we, this is online. Well, there's I guess also we the can problem keep of going. There's also the problem of signatures yeah. not matching. And there is a problem of, of young people and people of color being more likely to have their ballots rejected because the signatures don't match. And, you know, that's something mm -hmm. I know that San Mateo County is very careful with and lets people know if the signature doesn't match. But I don't know that all jurisdictions now that are jumping into the bandwagon jumping on the bandwagon of vote by mail have on their radar that they have to be aware of problems that can come up because of signature match. I think that's actually a bigger problem than voter fraud. Yeah. Well, that is all that we have time for. Uh, I'm Mark Simon. <laughs> and I'm Kevin Mullen. And thank you for being with us. We'll be back soon right here on online on the game. <laughs>